that text that we just read from Psalm 34 is not the same reason it's not there. Uh, but my name is Joe, so it must be the same reason. Well, it's very similar. Very similar. The Lord says, Psalm 34, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thank you very much, Gerard. Um, you have to wonder about the Dorian Gray type painting that the Bishop Hogan has in his attic, and when he tells you that we were both in the same class in UCD, it just the, the burden of office weighs more heavily on me of this. <laughs> um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening um, for, for this lecture. I want to thank firstly Mr. Dr. Clark and my colleague for uh, everything he has done to make the uh, lecture series, uh, to organize this lecture series, and I also want to thank my judicial assistant, Cormac Hickey, a graduate of the internship program who has done such fantastic work in organizing the, uh, the internship. And it, it's a, a particular pleasure for me to be speaking to you tonight in the uh, Hardiman lecture series because of, um, in memory of uh, a colleague of mine, Mr. Chris Hardiman, who died at a very un untimely circumstance in 2016, who was um, a really brilliant judge on the Supreme Court, a fantastic stylist, a man of great strength of opinions. Um, when he died, I think he was the, the most senior uh, ordinary judge on the Supreme Court, and I was the next most senior. Some unkind people said we disagree, disagreed about everything. This is untrue. We were, all, we were in complete and total agreement on one fact, which was how could one apparently intelligent person be so wrong about so many things? <laughs> <laughs> um, he, but he, Adrian was a fantastic advocate, uh, a brilliant judge, uh, a brilliant stylist, somebody who challenged uh, everything, who by his stubborn commitment to what he saw as principle, forced others to try and explain why they saw it as error. And during all that time, he was the most um, fascinating, interesting, and convivial companion, which I think is a great strength of the Irish system. Uh, there was nobody whose company I was more pleased to have around a lunch table or a dinner table, and I, was always, m I always marveled at the breadth of his knowledge. And I, I remember 10, 11 years ago, when this program was in its infancy, attending a simply brilliant lecture he gave on Joyce and the Law, one of his specialist topics, in the early days of in this internship program. And it was one of his great features that he wanted to encourage people at every stage, and particularly young people in the law, and particularly young people in the law encountering it for the first time and not coming from a traditional route. And I know he would be particularly pleased that this lecture se uh, series is named in his honor. So, um, Uh, if, you, if we turn to the topic of this great painting, that's why we're here today, and it tells a story, and, it, and there are so many stories connected with Sir Roger Casement that you, you, you can only scratch the surface and tell some of them. Um, I'm going to talk, obviously, about the connection of Sir Roger Casement to the law and uh, his, his trial and appeal. In 
On Good Friday, the 20th of April, 1916, a small inflatable dinghy was pulled up on a beach in North Kerry uh, on Bannistrand. Three men got out, the tallest of which was Sir Roger Casement. The other two were uh, uh, Daniel Daly and Captain Robert Monteith. Um, as, the, as the poem goes, no signal answered from the shore, Sir Roger sadly said. The, the U-boat had let, him off, the, let the three men off. They had landed, in, but nobody was there to meet them. Moreover, the odd, which was supposed to rendezvous with them in Tralee Bay, carrying 20,000 guns uh, under the command of Captain Spindler, failed to make that rendezvous and was actually challenged in or around that day and then was forced to run and ultimately he scuttled in Cove Harbour. Um, Sir, Sir Roger Casement was a, a fascinating, interesting and very well-known man in Ireland at that time. Um, he was born in Sandy Cove, as it happens, in Dublin, but he is most closely associated with the north of Ireland because his family, because he went to live with his family after his parents' death in North Antrim. Uh, and from, from there, he went to work in Liverpool, and from Liverpool, he went to work in Africa, and in Africa, he became a colonial officer. He became famous because he produced, in that capacity, uh, a, 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 a very important report on the atrocities being, con being carried out in what was then known as the Belgian Congo, then known as the Belgian Congo because it was the personal possession of King Leopold. Um, he was a person, for example, he was the first person whom jo Joseph Conrad met when he arrived in the Congo. And his report, and Con Conrad wrote very admiringly of him, uh, the report he wrote caused an international consternation. It was very, very significant, and he became something of a significant figure in, uh, in the United Kingdom in London, particularly in progressive circles. Thereafter, he was asked to conduct uh, an inquiry into the um, practices of, uh, in, the, in the rubber plantations in the Putumayo area of per, where I think Peru joins Bolivia. And he, he, he went there and produced again a damning report when a number of the Peruvian companies were listed on the London Stock Exchange and that was the ostensible basis upon which the, the report was sought. And again, he produced a damning report of the treatment of the people of the Putumayo, which again became a, a matter of inter, international notice and international acclaim. As a result, in 1911, he was knighted and wrote, as it happened, a somewhat obsequious letter thanking the Queen, the King for his, for his generosity um, a letter that was made some play of at his trial. But that's how, when he stepped on uh, off the, out of the little inflatable dinghy on Good Friday, the 20th of April, 1916, he was Sir Roger Casement, memorialized in Kerry, only in the name of the, in a very small plaque in the, um, in the train station in Tralee, and more significantly in the Sir Roger Caravan Park that still um, is one of the hot spots um, on, uh, near Banna Strand. Um, he, the three men made their way, decided to make their way towards Tralee. They got very, very, they didn't get very far inland. They arrived at a place called McKenna's Fort, which sounds more grand than it is. It's quite an evocative place to go and visit. It's quite close to um, uh, Tralee Golf Club. That's just a coincidence from my point of view. Um, uh, and Sir Roger Casement was not well, and he was left there, and the two men went to look for help. There was a sort of Keystone's Cop thing going on in Kerry at the time, because the Irish volunteers under the command of Austin Stack were looking for the people who, people who were reported to have landed at the same time as the police were also searching the area. In the short time that he was walking from, from the, made his way from the beach and got to McKenna's Fort, they, there were at least three individuals with whom they had some degree of interaction. One was a local farmer called John McCarthy who didn't necessarily say he see, th see them and they didn't see him, but he was the person who, who saw the boat that had landed small, uh, um, and saw, found some things around it and sent a message to the police um, in, uh, uh, about this, um, the boat that he had seen. Um, they walked along a little st a road, walked past a farm, this is in the very early morning, and it's just a sort of 
little social insight. There was a, a girl working in the farm who had come to work in the farm at five o'clock in the morning inside and looks out. And the girl called Mary Gorman, who's in actually her photograph is over there, as, um, uh, who saw these men in the early morning walking down, well dressed, walking down a street in, in north, north, uh, northwest Kerry. And after, uh, and while in the Kenneth's Fort, an, uh, two policemen come upon. Uh, Sir Roger, there's an exchange during which he does not identify his identity and they say oh, they're going to arrest him and to bring him to Tralee and they brought him to Tralee but they, to get to do that they had to get a cart and a, lot, a young boy in the area was sent to get the uh, cart. He brought it back and he noticed that the man um, uh, who, who was yet unidentified had dropped the piece of paper behind him and he picked it up and that was passed to the police and then became a piece of evidence in the trial. He was a boy called Martin Collins, I think about 14 years of age. He was arrested, brought to Tralee, kept in Tralee, moved from Tralee to Dublin overnight. He passes through Dublin on Easter, sun Easter Sunday and he has arrived in London on Easter Monday when the rising breaks out. He was interrogated in the Tower of London by two men, Admiral Je uh, Reginald Blinker Hall and Sir Basil Thompson, which is really the start of the intelligence services in the United Kingdom. And that's a sort of an indication uh, of, a, of an odd part of this story. Um, Casement, uh, Sir Basil Thompson said that Casement was, in his opinion, an idealist, not a self-seeker, but an extraordinarily vain man. And that's not an inaccurate uh, uh, description, I think. And the funny thing is that the pe there were only two groups of people who shared Casement's high opinion of his significance in, the whole, in all these events. Um, the leaders of the, of the Rising regarded Casement with some um, suspicion and distance. And for example, Mrs. Tom Clark later was to speak very disparagingly of him. But Casement believed himself to be a leader arriving to lead his people and his men, as he said. And in one sense, the British intelligence services believed that. Certainly, they were particularly interested in Casement because of the connection to Germany. Because Casement had, after his knighthood, had left the Foreign Service and had, had become very involved in Irish nationalism. In 1912, he was a significant mover in the house gun running, which, re he regard which was regarded as a, a sort of triumph. Um, and he then was in America with John Devoy in 1914 when the war broke out. He was gathering money for the Irish cause. And he then set sail for Germany, went uh, with his then companion Adler, Chris, Adler Christensen and arrived in Germany to throw his lot in with, with Germany, with England's enemy. And uh, while in Germany, he, he made contact with the German high command and at one stage they thought that he was going to be a, a great figure that would assist in mobilizing Ireland in, in the war against uh, England. Um, and he went around a number of the concentration camps, most no notably Limburg camp, and tried to recruit Irish soldiers to become members of an Irish brigade to fight, as it was said, on the side of the Axis, or on the side of the German forces against the Allies, although it was said not against their own um, Irish regiments. And uh, that, that was ca what Casement sought to do. It was signally unsuccessful, but that was to be one of the main charges against him and it had become known that, that uh, Sir, Sir Roger Casement, a knight of the realm, a hero and a humanitarian hero was in, in Germany was and I was attempting to recruit and suborn as it would have seen, been seen soldiers who were committed to the, the um, cause of the United Kingdom to fight against England. Um, he had, uh, that, that had been largely, largely a failure he had then heard of the rising. He had set sail in conjunction with the odd. He had gone from Berlin to Wilhelmshaven in the, the 12th of April. In his pocket when he was arrested was a ticket from Berlin to Wilhelmshaven, 12th of April, 1916. Not easy to explain, but as you'll see, the e evidence wasn't the major problem as far as the prosecution were concerned in the trial. But as I say, he arrives in London on Easter Monday, he's interrogated in the Tower of London, and it is decided later by Sir Basil Thompson in conjunction with the then Attorney General F.E. Smith that he is to be put on trial 
lest, as Thompson said, they, lest we are to be said to have killed him in secret. Um, and as you may know, <laughs> this spoiler alert, you know the end of this story. He was executed on the 3rd of, Ma of August 1916, just four months after the leaders of the Rising had been executed. And when people talk about the 16 men who were executed as a result of their part in the Rising, 15 were executed in, in Dublin, in Ireland, and one, Sir Roger Casement, hanged uh, in, in London. But the difference between the treatment of Sir Roger Casement and the treatment of the, uh, the leaders of the, of the Rising is really quite striking, the legal difference, and it's illustrated by this magnificent painting. The trials that occurred immediately after Easter week, and I use that term advisedly, because as a matter of the law that was then applicable, and certainly British law, what was conducted in, in Dublin in, in the week after Easter 1916, the weeks after Easter 1916, were trials, not martial law outside the law. They were trials under the defense of the Realm Act 1914, and that act permitted trials not before judges, before military officers, in secret, in private, not in public, and with no legal representation and, and, uh, and with no right of appeal. And by contrast, as you can see, Sir Roger Casement, when he was brought to London, was the subject of one of the great set pieces of English law, a trial at bar, um, which involved ultimately a trial uh, before uh, in which he was represented on, uh, because of the provisions of the tr respective treasons acts by, by a number of counsel, and we'll come to that. Um, the trial was not only in public, it was one of the great events of that period to the point where there are photographs which you can see of people queuing to get into the Lord Chief Justice's court on the Strand and where tickets were printed. And there's one particularly poignant tr ticket that you can see that says, admit one Gertrude Bannister to the Lord Chief Justice Court for day, uh, day one of the trial, seating is not reserved. Gertrude Bannister was Roger Casement's most faithful cousin, who you can see in the painting here, sitting in the front row with the solicitors, the, wo the woman with, one of the women with the bonnet there, the one with her head sitting back. Um, but that's how public the event was, in stark contrast to what happened in, um, in Dublin. And in Dublin, some of the trials took 15 minutes. The, this was a, a trial at bar. The original trial was presided over by the Lord Chief Justice, Sir Rufus Isaacs, Lord Reading, and Mr. Justice uh, Avery and Mr. Justice Horridge. Um, as I say, there was full representation. Now, uh, and then uh, the, the full majesty of the law, and that was very much a designed feature because part of what was sought to be done as far as the British government was concerned was to pre present the British cause to the as, as yet still neutral United States in particular and show these were the values of fairness and British justice that were being maintained and were being fought for in the First World War. Um, now, and of course, as I said, one of the features of the trials in Dublin was that there was no appeal, whereas a trial at bar for treason in in London carried with it the right of appeal to the relatively recently formed Court of Criminal Appeal. Now, one of the skills of the artist here uh, who is Sir John Lavery, who was a, a, a brilliant painter of the time, very probably the foremost society painter of the time, and was left a fantastic historical record because he painted every one of the, the, the people involved in the treaty negotiations, for, uh, for example, because he was quite sympathetic to the Irish cause, as was his wife, Lady Lavery, who you used to see on the pound, the pound note, so then on the watermark on the punt, and I think she may now have disappeared from our currency, sadly. But um, the old <laughs> and you will, if you look, yes. The, um, <laughs> if you're in a museum, <laughs> you might see. Anyway, Lady Lavery was a significant society beauty very much taken by the Irish cause, and Sir John Lavery paints the painting. And if you were to see this, I think some people call this the trial of Roger Casement. Uh, that used to incense Sir John Lavery. It's called high treason. One of the reasons why it's not the trial, it presents 
to the viewer, I think, of the trial because the artist was allowed to sit in the jury box. And one of the things he does is, 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 is the way that the, the painting, as it were, swivels around on its side. It's most courts, you look front to back and you look at the judges, but, you, but because it's painted from the jury box, Roger Casement is right in the center of the, of the, the portrait and under the clock that is set at five minutes to midnight or five minutes to midday. Um, and you are being asked at some level to judge him, to act as a jury, um, because you're, you, you, in a, and, and, in, and I think the sympathy of the artist is pretty obvious in the, in the way he puts Casement in, in the dead center, as it were, of the painting. Um, and what makes that something of a trick is that this is not the trial of Roger Casement. This is not uh, sitting at the view the jury. It's the view the jury had, but not the jurors, um, because this is the appeal of Sir Roger Casement, the Court of Criminal Appeal. Now, um, Casement was a, a very handsome man, uh, and a, I think a very intelligent man, and he has fascinated people ever since. More books have been written about Sir Roger Casement than I think all the other executed leaders of the, ri uh, of the Rising in 1916 put together. They continue to be written about him year after year. Um, one of the things that he has captured the imagination of at least three Nobel laureates, George Bernard Shaw, who to his great credit was involved in petitioning for clemency for Casement and, and offering typically Shavian assistance to the defense. W.B. Yeats, who wrote a poem about, um, more than one poem about Casement. And um, only a few years ago, I was lucky enough to hear the great um, Peruvian laureate Mario, Mario Vargas Llosa come to Dublin and speak about his book, The Dream of the Celt, which is a novelistic account of the life of Roger Casement, a fairly faithful uh, novelistic account. And v Vargas Llosa, who had, was from Peru, could not believe that there was not a greater record memorial to Casement either in Peru or in the Congo. And he came to Dublin at the time the book was published, spoke in Dublin um, in the Instituto Cervantes, and came here to see this painting that you're looking at now. Um, and, and in a sense, that, you know, that captures something of the breadth of, the uh, uh, of this attraction of Roger Casement. And one of the things, uh, and he's just an endlessly interesting character, and of course, one of the things that we'll come to that made him interesting and has maintained his interest was the fact that he was cer almost certainly gay, not just gay, but had left diaries that were controversial, which are now largely, I think, almost, but not entirely, by there are some people who still, con sti some people still believe that the diaries were malicious forgeries produced by British intelligence to, to smear his reputation. But the diaries were, uh, at their time, and perhaps even now, of an extraordinarily graphic nature in recounting his, his, um, his encounters, uh, both in, uh, in London, in um, uh, the Congo, in Peru, and I see Gavin Woods here in that uh, happening place in Warren Point, which uh, in, in, in County Down. So, and, uh, and part of, and that is all added to the legend, both the question, the question of, his, of his personal life, the issue about the diaries, and how that, is to, how that was to be reconciled in, in a period where Ireland, for the most part, had a very one-dimensional view of its her heroes. But he was a brilliant phrase maker, and people didn't, I think, to, to, didn't, didn't really understand that. And one of the things he said has really, two of the things he said in his famous speech from the dock, which is, well, have really characterized a lot of subsequent discussion about the legal aspects of his uh, life, and in particular his trial. Firstly, he spoke, he said it was a judicial assassination. And, that, um, and the second thing is, he, not in the speech from the dock, but otherwise, he spoke disparaging, disparagingly of lawyers in general. He said to his friend um, in, a, in a letter just after the, um, the, 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 the end of the legal process, you know what I have always said about lawyers. I say it now again, only more so. They are a race apart. And as for their cooks and blackstones, and what is a cook but an emasculated blackstone, and Flemings and all the rest, God deliver me, I say, from such an antiquaries 
as these, to hang a man's life upon a comma and throttle him with a semicolon. And in that passage, he gave the line, which has stayed with the trial of Roger Casement, the appeal of Roger Casement ever since, that he was hanged by a comma. And, um, uh, and I want to look, I, I hope, briefly enough at the, um, at the lawyers and at the trial and say, again, that um, that picture that he, that he gave, gave has really remark influenced the view of the trial ever since. And so if you go to the Vargas Losa book or recent books, they still have a view of the trial as being, in a sense, the British machine being used and not really a fair fight and, and, and have very disparaging pictures of all the lawyers, of the lawyers involved. So from our point of view, I think it's interesting to look at this. Now, if you look at the lawyers, the first thing to look at is not the lawyers who are there, but the lawyers who weren't there, because in a sense, that characterizes or puts in a different light any criticisms that might be leveled at those who came to the trial. The lawyers who weren't there were, were very distinguished. Um, the, the first person, the first, one of the solicitors of approach to appear for casement was Sir Charles Russell, who was the son of Lord Russell of Cologne, the brilliant Lord Chief Justice of, of England, but born in Newry, uh, County Down, and the man who conducted the brilliant defence of Parnell at the Parnell Commission. Sir Charles Russell's firm had been, a, it was a distinguished firm in London, had actually acted for the Marquess of Queensbury in the, Mar in the Oscar Wilde trial, and he refused to act for him, um, uh, refused the brief. The, the brief was offered to a barrister, Sir Henry Dickens, Charles Dickens' son, and he refused on the grounds he didn't have requisite experience, which seems doubtful. And most significantly, the two very senior QCs were approached. In, in fairness, I should say, the brief was not, I think, formally offered to them. They were approached through Gertrude Bannister. One was Sir Gordon Hewitt, who was to become the Lord Chief Justice and regarded as the worst Lord Chief Justice of the, of the 20th century, although his quote in the Queen Against Sussex Justice's ex party McCarthy, that justice must not only be done but be seen to be done, lives on. But, you know, that sort of curious irony that the worst, apparently, Lord Chief Justice gave the most ringing statement of the importance of, of, of open justice. And he was a, he was a very well-known liberal politician in his day, um, and uh, in, in, he, and indeed involved in the government, and he um, did not accept the brief. And the other was an even more distinguished lawyer, Sir John Simon, um, and a a contemporary of Effie Smith's at Oxford, a man who managed, e even though a member of the Liberal Party, to hold the great offices of state. He was, Lord, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, Foreign Secretary and Home Secretary, and later in 1940 became the Lord Chancellor. And he, although apparently reasonably sympathetic to the Irish cause, refused to act. Now, he may have had a reasonable excuse because he had until very recently been the Attorney General and a member of the government, but either way, Two, at least two QCs appeared to act, which gave rise to, to the not inaccurate legend that, that no English lawyer, no English barrister would appear for casement. Um, so if we look at the judges here, uh, who they are, they, 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 they're on, on in the center with that very great, that uh, aquiline profile is Mr. Justice Darling. And he was, a very well-known judge of the time, slightly controversial, known for witticisms and wit, and as a result, and a, there's a book called The Wit and Wisdom of Mr. Justice Darling, as a result, he was, I think, rightly disliked by most practicing lawyers because he saw cases as an opportunity of showing off his wit. He was a former conservative MP, and he, he had spoken in, in fairly hostile terms about what should happen in Ireland. But he's the reason we have the painting, because he was a client of Sir John Lavery and was keen at having himself paint, painted. And Lavery was not beyond presenting him in that sort of really impressive um, uh, profile. One of the paintings that he had painted of himself was in his judicial attire with the wig, with the black cap, which a judge would have to wear when passing the sentence of death, a painting that Effie Smith said was in the worst possible taste, and I'm, incli I'm inclined to agree. Um, uh, 
and, and if you were to pick out somebody, and Darling's appointment was regarded as it was said, said by Asquith to be the most startling example in political patronage of, of, of any period. And as I say, he was hostile to home rule, and so therefore, um, he's, in his suspect number one, if this was to be a judicial assassination, and I regret to say that he doesn't fit that, his conduct at the trial of the appeal doesn't give rise to anything that would support that theory. On either side of him are Mr. Justice Bray, Mr. Justice Lawrence, um, well-known High Court judges. Mr. Justice Lawrence's son was also a judge and a judge at Nuremberg, as it happens, and his son, if you like, Mr. Justice Lawrence's grandson, and again, this may be, you may be too young for this, but it's a man called Lord John Oxy, who was both a successful amateur jockey and then subsequently a racing commentator. So they were, and they were standard issue, good High Court judges sitting here in the Court of Appeal. And on either side are two of the greatest judges of the 20th century. Nearest to us is Sir Thomas Scrutton, one of the great commercial lawyers of all time. Scrutton won charter parties. Um, and, uh, and on the other side is Lord Atkin, Mr. Justice Atkin as he was then, the author of Donoghue and Stevenson, and most importantly or significantly in this context, the author of the dissenting, great dissenting judgment in Liverside and Sidgen Anderson during the Second World War when he um, w was prepared to adopt a strictly literal interpretation of the legislation uh, not in, in dissent from the rest of his colleagues to the point and expressed in such terms that the Lord Chancellor approached him and said, look, in effect, I appreciate the fact you want to dissent, but do you have to say that this is Ant Alice in Wonderland? And Atkin refused to change that, and his colleagues sent him to Coventry uh, didn't speak to him again before his death. And the Lord Chancellor, who asked him to do that, was Sir John Simon. Um, now, but, but Sir Thomas Scrutton here is interesting because, you know, we take a view about England, um, England Ireland, English lawyers, um, people like Darling fit the bill. Sir Thomas Scrutton was a liberal and a liberal candidate in 1886 at the time of the first Home Rule Bill. And he had this to say about um, home rule. And we, he said, and he gave this lecture, as a, sorry, as a, uh, and why should we cling so fondly to that act of union? It was born in bribery, bolstered up by bayonets. It was unlovely in its birth, unsuccessful in its life. To the countries it professed to unite, it has brought not peace but the sword. And I, for one, shall assist with joy at its death and burial, only regretting they have been delayed so long. So, um, you know, if your case turned on a rigorous uh, upholding of a strictly literal interpretation of an act, even in the middle of wartime, you could look to both Scrutton and Atkin uh, with, with a high degree of um, a confidence, if not expectation. So those were the judges. Um, the lawyers on the prosecution side um, as you would expect, there was a sort of all-star team. The juniors were um, here on the furthest beside the man standing, who was Sergeant Sullivan, the, man, the next man closest in the junior benches, is a man called G.E. Branson, who went on to become a High Court judge. But you might not know him, but you may know his grandson, Sir Richard Branson. Um, the man here, annoying uh, senior counsel, and that's an important thing, um, and saying, look at the book, I've found something, uh, is a man called Archibald Bodkin, who became the first DPP and distinguished himself in 1922 by recommending the banning of Ulysses, a book that contained, as, as he said, a fair degree of unmitigated filth. <laughs> um, and over here, you have Travers Humphreys, probably one of the greatest criminal lawyers in the English system in the 20th century, who was long-time junior, never took silk, and was appointed directly to the High Court, and for, I think, 30 years, tried the most serious uh, criminal trials in London. Sitting here, you have the Solicitor General, Sir jo George Cave, um, who later became the Lord Chancellor, uh, and a, a, a conservative politician, um, uh, and, a, and a, a successful barrister. And here, the QC studiously avoiding the, the attentions of his, his junior is F.E. Smith, later to be Lord Birkenhead, one of the greatest barristers of his day, 
now the Attorney General and one of the most controversial figures both in law and politics. Um, controversial because, of, because he was the Galloper Smith, he was uh, Edward Carson's most loyal lieutenant. There is a magnificent photograph, one of my favourite photographs of, is of 1912 after the, the Larn, Bangor and Dunahidee gun runnings to which the host gun running was, a, was in a sense a, a, re a response which were an incredible exercise in the in importation and distribution of arms throughout Northeast Ireland as it was at the time. There is a, a, a photograph of the uh, ultra volunteer force bearing the arms lined up in military formation being reviewed by Sir Edward Carson and uh, F.E. Smith, both senior politicians and senior bar lawyers, senior barristers and QCs and former uh, for former holders of the office of, I think, Solicitor General, and later, very shortly, to become Lords of Appeal and Ordinary in the House of Lords. And they are walking up and down, re um, reviewing the ranks of the Ultra Volunteer Force, bearing gun guns which have been illegally imported from where? From Germany. And that's not irrelevant, because that's exactly the point that, Mr. that Roger Casement wanted to make, that he was in the dock for importing from Germany guns which was, as he viewed it, nothing more than the man who was leading the prosecution had done. And he made, and again, um, uh, he made that point, Casement made that point very effectively. He said, the difference between us was that the unionist champions chose a path that they felt would lead to the Woolsack. And it was only a short time later that Smith became the Lord Chancellor. While I went a road which must lead to the dock, and the event proves we were both right, the difference between us was that my treason was based on a ruthless sincerity that forced me to attempt in time and season to carry out in action what I said in word, whereas their treason lay in verbal incitement they knew they may need never may be made good in their bodies. And so I am prouder to stand here today in the traitor's dock to answer this impeachment than to fill the place of my right honourable accusers. And that's... Um, it's very powerful and it was directed straight at F.E. Smith. Um, now, as I say, from a legal point of view, he was a, a, a really brilliant barrister. I mean, he's, he's a figure that is no longer in vogue. He was a sort of buccaneering imperialist, um, but the sort of person I think you'd certainly want on your side and yet you would probably like to have dinner with. Um, he was famous for giving cheek to judges um, and the stories are told about him and still repeated that on one occasion um, a, a judge said to him, young man, you are being offensive, uh, you're being, sorry, you're being, you're being rude, to which Smith immediately replied, in fact, we both are. The difference is I'm trying, uh, I'm trying and you are not. <laughs> um, he, that's a paraphrase, I'm afraid. The, he, the other one was, the famous one was, he said, a judge said to him, I've listened to you for more than an hour and I'm no wiser, to which he immediately replied, no wiser certainly, but better informed. <laughs> um, now, um, there are some barristers here and I hope there are people here who plan to be barristers and that you, everyone always takes pleasure in the teacher being given cheek and the, the response because of the, in a sense, the relationship in a courtroom, you tend to cheer when for once in the, every so often the judge gets a, um, a, a, a punch in the, in the face. But just remember, just remember this, that those witticisms are still spoken of 120 years later, you know. And unless you think your witticism has got that type of longevity, I think, you know, there's, there's an argument for thinking better of it. Um, so that's F.E. Smith. Um, as I say, one of the most sought after barristers of the time. As it happened, the, the trial judge, Sir Rufus Isaacs, had, had had his own difficulties in the Marconi scandal. Who had he retained to act for him? His political opponents, F.E. Smith and Lord Carson, and that gave a little bit of a frisson to the trial as well. The defence team were a more motley crew, but um, in the middle of the painting here you have one of the lawyers whose, whose reputation emerged unscathed and enhanced, and one of the heroes of the trial, indeed one of the heroes of Irish law, George Gavin Duffy. His father, Charles Gavin Duffy, a young Irelander, had been transported as a after, after the Young Ireland Rebellion and had become Prime Minister of Victoria. 
the family had returned. Gavin Duffy had been educated in England at Stonyhurst. He was now a partner in a London firm, a successful London firm, and he was asked to act for Casement and indeed asked, or wrote to Casement saying, I understand you're not represented and your friends are anxious that you'll be represented. His partners told him that he was not to accept the instructions. And he said he would, and they dissolved the partnership, leaving Gavin Duffy outside. And he, um, uh, as I say, yeah, performed admirably during the trial, ultimately changed profession, went to the bar, came to Ireland, was involved in the treaty negotiations himself, was briefly the Minister for Foreign Affairs, drifted away. Um, Eamon de Valera, want, who relied on him, wanted to appoint him Attorney General. The Cabinet rebelled because Gavin Duffy had been a, a participant in the treaty negotiations. Um, and he then became, as we know, President of the High Court and one of the great, great judges of, of, of Irish law. The Council are... Um, if we take, take junior, and the, you'll see the council are standing in the juniors' benches here. And the council who were retained, they were entitled to retain two councils. Um, firstly, you have here, in this, over here, a man who is offering his services pro bono, and another man who, who comes out of this well, Professor John Hartnett Morgan, J.H. Morgan, Professor of Constitutional Law in University College London had written a book called The New Irish Constitution in 1912, or edited a book in, uh, called The New Irish Constitution, which is a series of essays on the Home Rule Bill of 1912. Um, and he knew Casement. He was a professor of constitutional law. He offered his services, and he was the person who promoted the, the, the legal argument. Beside him is another name that has a certain legal resonance, his junior counsel, Artemis Jones. And those of you who know anything about the law of libel, may know the case of Hulton and Jones, 1910 appeal cases, which establishes the principle of unintentional defamation, that, that it does not matter it, whether the newspaper knew that there was a person or that they were referring to a person if it is defamatory of a real person. In that case, um, I just better I move on <laughs> um, uh, because time is pressing. And standing up in the middle of the painting is Sergeant Sullivan, A.M. Sullivan, an Irish barrister, standing in the junior benches, a, a cousin of Gavin Duffy's, a son of A.M. Sullivan, himself a young Irelander, who produced, as it happens, a book on speeches from the dock. And Sergeant Sullivan, the, sar the rank of sergeant in Irish law was, in, was well, and indeed in the law of the United Kingdom, but sergeants only now existed in Ireland. It was a rank that was regarded as higher than the rank of, of KC or QC and took precedence in court in Ireland. And indeed, as a sergeant, as one of the king's sergeants, it took precedent, precedence in the Privy Council. Right? I, unable to, to find an English QC, Gavin Duffy turned to his, co his cousin and said, you are the only man who can do this. Sullivan um, said he, he had doubts about it. He said, um, you know, I, Firstly, I'm a, I'm a sergeant, and that, that requires me to prosecute cases in Ireland and not to take cases for the defence. They, deci they decided that. And secondly, and more interestingly, he said, um, the law has changed in England. The Criminal Evidence Act of 1898 permits the accused to give evidence in their own defence. Up until then, that was not permitted. That did not change in Ireland until 1924. And C Sullivan said, my, my mind is too trained in the groove. I may not be able you know, to act in circumstances where the rules have changed so significantly. He consulted two people, one Mr. Justice Stephen Ronan and the other the great Chief Baron ba Pallis, and both of them said, you must take the brief. And he went to London, uh, and he accepted and took the brief and went and defended uh, Casement. Finally, there's one other lawyer involved whose head you can see here, and that's the head of Michael Francis Doyle, who was an Irish-American lawyer who had defended uh, Liam Mellows, in, or had acted for Liam Mellows in the United States. He had helped in to finding Eamon de Valera's birth certificate. He had been private secretary to William Jennings Bryan, the twice unsuccessful Democratic candidate for presidency. He was a friend of a man called Joseph Tumulty, who was the then private secretary, effectively the chef de cabinet of Woodrow Wilson. Um, and he was closely allied to the, the Irish cause in, in Ireland, in the United States, and he, was, he came over. The lawyers 
were particularly keen to welcome him because he was bringing the fees. Um, but it's a sign of where, what was going on here that the court permitted Doyle to sit in the lawyer's benches because part of what, and to, to be part of the legal team, because part of what was sought to be done here was to show America in particular how fair the system was. And so therefore you see there's a slight, there's an apparent contrast between the position of Doyle and Sergeant Sullivan, because Sergeant Sullivan was only a junior consul in England, and therefore was addressing the, the court from the junior benches. And that gives rise to two different stories. Um, one of which is, is this, um, is, a, is, is from the artistic point of view. You'll see there is counsel in the senior benches in front of the defence team. And it is said that Sir John Lavery complained about the fact that, that this provide, there was a void in the, in the painting and that the perspective, you know, that it had appeared all wrong, that there was just this empty space in a key part of the painting. And Darling uh, suggested that he put somebody in there and he put in Sir John Simon, who was the man who had refused the brief, but who, who is photographed as having attended at the trial and looked in. But the fact that Simon is presented there when he wasn't sitting in the senior benches has given rise to a form of sort of low-grade parlor game, game among, sort of, uh, among people who are interested in both the trial and the painting, because then they say, well, who else is in the painting? And it's said that the man, that he, the, the man standing taking a note on the, the, at the edge of the bench with that sort of dust coat on is, in, in, is a self-portrait of Sir John Lavery. And in another painting, because there, you'll see, a, see the balcony up there, there, at the very top, there's a representation in another of the paintings of the drafts of this of figures. And it said you can see the painting of, um, or the, the features of Lady Lavery. But one of the legends I grew up with was that Sullivan was refused silk um, and that this was one more way in which the, the British system was showing itself to be fundamentally unfair to, to Ireland. And um, Effie Smith is blamed for that. The truth is a bit more nuanced as the truth often is. Effie Smith was very conscious of the fact that it looked like an, 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 an uneven and unbalanced team not from a painterly point of view, but from observer's point of view. And he went to the Lord Chancellor, Lord Finlay, and he said, will you give Sullivan silk so that he can stand, be in the senior benches and it'll, it'll be balanced up? And Finlay refused. But again, not for reasons of hostility to either Casement or Sullivan. There was a convention in, in, in both world wars, but there was a convention in the first world war that silk would not be given to any junior barrister for the duration of the war, lest that would promote somebody over someone who had gone to fight in the First World War. So nobody took silk between 1914 and 1919. In 1919, there was a job lot of silks, uh, uh, juniors who were, who were given silk and became QCs. The Lord Chancellor was Lord Birkenhead, and the first two, if not the first two, among that, two of the people who were given silk at that time were Artemis Jones, and Sergeant Sullivan. So, um, but Artemis Jones was Welsh, J.H. Morgan was Welsh, Sergeant Sullivan was Irish, Gavin Duffy was Irish, and Michael Francis Doyle was American. That didn't stop Lord Reading with unconscious irony saying at the end of the trial that the lawyers had done everything that could be done and had acted in the highest traditions of the English bar. <laughs> um, so that's, those are the teams, those are the lawyer, the judges, and what about the law that, um, and that, the comma? Well, in it, in, he was tried with, for treason contrary to the, an act of Edward III of 1351. Now that deserves repetition. 1351 is 565 years before the trial. Um, and the argument was, and that the, and that the way in which that was phrased was, or if a man be adherent to the king's enemies in his realm, giving to the maiden comfort in the realm or elsewhere, and thereof be probably attainted of open deed by the people of their condition. Now, that's pretty hard to decipher in its own terms. Um, um, the question was, did the words in the realm or elsewhere, in a sense, extend to the, the act of treason? 
the act of treason here being alleged or being alleged to be five acts of suborning of British troops in the various concentration camps in Mosul and I think most of all Limburg um, uh, prison of war camp. Uh, the the ar historical argument was in, in 1351 sovereignty was a very different thing than it is now or even was then and you know England owned a big had a the, the queen of the king and queen of England had a ch big chunk of France loyalty was in a sense territorial depending on where you were and there was a sub uh, there was an argument or was argued that treason was only capable of being committed within the realm and that there was some support some significant support for that argument partly because a subsequent act of the time of Henry VIII and therefore a very modern act in 1916 did provide explicitly for treason outside the realm and there was the usual reading back and saying well that must mean that the first more general phrase did not in, it did not capture that but but if you think that that's difficult to understand you have to remember this is 1351 it's not there it's not in English at all it's an Anglo Norman French so I, I won't even attempt to pronounce it <laughs> but apart from anything else there was no punctuation at that time so our, our punctuation was shown by a series of transverse marks not by commas or semicolons and Darling and Atkin actually consulted the statute rules and there was a debate as to whether what they what you could see was a mark a transverse mark or a crease but uh, the argument was anyway the, and th this was the argument and it involved Sir Rufus Isaac saying and I think to some extent it was a su success for the defense that it got this far he said in my judgment the words giving to the maiden comfort may be read as a parenthesis yet I do not confine the application of the words or elsewhere to that parenthesis I think they apply just as much to the parenthesis as to the words which precede it my view is that the words or elsewhere govern both limbs of the sentence and that's not a particularly grammatical reason a reading of, of, of a fairly complicated or difficult to interpret provision but in fact it was a difficult point to run because there was the Cooks and Blackstones and others had said for hundreds of years that the 1351 statute may pr provided for um, the treason being capable of being committed outside the realm but that didn't really matter there was a uh, um, you, one of the 16 men executed in and one of the more sort of poignant cases of, of the Easter Rising was was um, Cap Captain John McBride John, John, McBride, John McBride's father um, who was who was on his way to meet his brother on Easter Monday and saw the preparations and said I'll join you and he received a command why did he receive a command because he had fought for the Boers against the British and that was an extremely popular thing in Ireland and indeed in fairness popular among some circles in or in the, in England and um, because some a lot of progressive people in England uh, m objected to the war the, the Boer War and another man who fought in exactly the same situation was a man called Colonel Lynch who was an Australian Irish man and he was so popular in Ireland that he was elected an MP for Galway and he when he went to Westminster to take up his seat he was arrested and tried with treason for having fought with the Boers against the United Kingdom and he was defended by Horace Avery who then became Mr Justice Avery who was the trial judge and that case decided if not definitively in the sense that the Court of Criminal Appeal was here hearing this case but that case decided a relatively short time before Casement's trial that treason that the 1351 Act captured treasons committed outside the realm now the more interesting thing for me is why that issue arose at all I said he was treason is an offense of the mind it's an, very interesting it's being disloyal but it requires what are called overt acts and they must be charged casement was tried with was charged with six overt acts of treason five of them were Self, uh, were Limburg camp suborning of um, of of soldiers, but the sixth was was was, f was form formulated in this way: On or about the 12th of April 1916, setting forth from the Empire of Germany, 
as a member of a warlike and hostile expedition undertaken and equipped by the said enemies of our Lord the King, having for its object the introduction into and landing on the coast of Ireland of arms and ammunition intended for use in the prosecution of the said war by the said enemies against our Lord and King his, and his subjects. So he was being charged, the overt act was leaving Germany as a member of a warlike and hostile, hostile expedition, um, having as its object the introduction into and landing on the coast of Ireland of arms and am ammunition. So he was being charged with leaving Germany, but not with landing in Ireland. Okay. So it was very deliberately being the, the location of that of, uh, of offence is outside the realm of the United Kingdom. And the, the evidence, and it was, it was that charge which led to what was called the parade of Irish witnesses who ended up in this sort of really, I think, fascinating photograph because all the policemen and the local witnesses who were all the Irish together in London end up taking a group photograph. And among the Irish witnesses were John McCarthy, the man who was in the, um, who found the dinghy, uh, Martin Collins, the boy you see here walk, and this girl, Mary Gorman, the girl who looked out the window, the serving girl, um, and a number of other witnesses and a number of, uh, of RIC men. And they ended all, all Irish witnesses, all in London, to prove the charge of leaving Germany as a member of a warlike force. And they proved the charge of leaving Germany with a warlike force by proving that they landed in Ireland. So, so, so it, it appears very obvious that a deliberate attempt is being made, maybe not, maybe not very obvious, but it seems to me a very deliberate attempt is being made to avoid charging Casement with anything he did in Ireland. And if that's, and that's in fact, if anything, uh, clearer, because when he was charged when he was brought to the, the Tower of London, he was technically released and recharged. And as some, I suppose, lawyers here know that the, the charge you get when you're charged, say, in the district court is sometimes different from the indictment that is then presented when you're returned for trial and you see, and then the book of evidence is delivered. And the charge with which, and that's what happened here, but the charge with which he was charged in, uh, was uh, in, 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 the, in Bow, Street, Ma Bow Street Magistrate Court was with unlawfully, maliciously, and traitorously did commit high treason within and without the realm of England in contempt of our sovereign lord, the king, and his law. So one way or another, he was originally charged with treason within the realm, now, as well as without the realm, in which case the significance of the legal point would, would, would severely dimin diminish, if not fall away. And Sullivan always maintained um, focused on that point. Well, wh wh why, was that, why might that be significant? The significance is venue. There was an act of Henry VIII, again, which provided that treasons outside the realm could be tried in Middlesex. Venue was a, you know, sort of a key feature of the criminal law in its early days. And if you had charged casement with treason, part of which involved landing in the, the coast of Kerry, well, then there was a real risk that there was going to be a significant argument that that's where the trial had to take place. And that was a risk which was increasing, but there was always a risk um, because in the inquiry into the 1916 uh, rising, one of the things that is recorded is it was increasingly difficult to secure convictions for, so, for, for political type offences or anything that had a resonance of that even prior to 1916. And of course we know how quickly opinion turned post-1916. And there was a further problem, which was that the Defence of the Realm Act provided for trial without a jury. That was, that was objected to in, the, in Parliament as being something that removed a right, a civil liberty from citizens of the United Kingdom. And so there was an amendment providing that citizens of, or subjects of the, the, the Crown had an entitlement to trial by jury. And in fact, when Casement was brought to the Tower of London, he was warned and given that entitlement which he exercised. But, but the amendment to the Defence of the Realm Act that, that restored right, the entitlement to trial by jury 
also permitted for that to be set aside by a proclamation that conditions in the country were such that it could not be, be, be permitted. And such a proclamation had been made in Dublin in Easter week, which is why the trials in, in Dublin did not take place in public. But you would then would, if you would then had to seek to try casement in Ireland n not w without the benefit of a jury, you would be facing into the argument that, um, that that proclamation was no longer valid because the conditions didn't no longer applied, in which case there might then have been an argument that the trial would have to take place before a jury, in which case the conviction might not have been secured. Now, sorry, <laughs> the, um, uh, that's uh, one of the interesting features of the trial. Was the trial fair? Fundamentally, yes. A number of stories have come out of the trial and the conduct of the people involved in the trial, mostly connected to F.E. Smith. Uh, the first was that he called the defence team to his, his, his house, said, would you like to hear my opening speech? He gave the opening spe speech and they said, that's really good, F.E., but really maybe we shouldn't say some of those things um, because we may not be able to prove them. And he said, it's too late. It's already been wired to America to appear in the New York Times of the following day. Um, and that, that, that's the sort of PR of it. Um, the second thing he did was the, uh, the defense team exercised a power which you had in England in only in treason trials, but which was, which was the law in Ireland. You had unlimited right of challenge, whereas the prosecution could only challenge five members of the jury. And the defense started to, to challenge anybody and everybody and to try and secure a jury that was in some way going to be favorable to casement and Smith said this is what, what you know what's going on here and they said um, well that's that's what the law provides and he says there's no way there's no answer to that and said well actually the Attorney General has the right personally not the prosecution it's a personal right of the Attorney General to exercise the right and so he did exercise exactly the same right and that was regarded as a little bit of um, tough rough play I would say um, not as rough as some of the Armagh players at the weekend <laughs> And, and, and not against the rules. The, the, the other thing was, I think, um, if you may remember, when um, Casement said, I, uh, my road led to the dock, his road led to the Woolsack, Smith got up and said very audibly, change places with him, nothing doing, and walked out of court, which it doesn't make the trial unfair, but was... was fairly poor behavior from somebody who was landing very heavy blows in circumstances where at this stage Sir Roger Casemith had been sentenced to, had, had I think been sentenced to death, or sorry, was on trial for his life because this was a statement, an un, uh, a statement made from the dock. And finally, um, and that just is a, a poor sign I think of, of Smith, but also a sign that he, s he recognized that the trial was slipping away from him, not in terms of the verdict, but in terms of who was to be the star and whether this was to present British justice as he wanted it presented, particularly to the United States, or rather was it was, was casement somehow in a way taking over uh, and framing how the trial would, was going to be heard, was going to be seen. Finally, um, there was another in incident which was that when the, the appeal here was, uh, was unsuccessful, um, they sought to appeal to the House of Lords. You can only appeal to the House of Lords from the court, new Court of Criminal Appeal with the fiat, that's with the permission, of the Attorney General, the Attorney General being F.E. Smith himself. He refused it. It was argued, um, really, this doesn't look so good. Maybe you should find some way, without, ex without saying that there's anything in the point, maybe you should find some way to say there should be an appeal. The reason, by the way, that all the appeals are sought is goes back to Colonel Lynch's case. Colonel Lynch was convicted but was, was not executed. He was, it, it was commuted because if you could wait, out, wait it out long enough, the campaign for clemency might succeed. Um, so it was said to him, perhaps Professor Morgan says it's a good point. He has consul consulted William Holdsworth. Sir William Holdsworth, the most famous figure in, the history, in, in, in English legal history at the time. And he says it's, a, it's an important point. And surely you can say that if Sir, well, you don't think anything of it, if Sir William Holdsworth an eminent lawyer, eminent historian, thinks it's a good point that you're willing to so certify to allow the House of Lords to decide. And Smith's reputed to have said, I know Sir William Holdsworth is an eminent and distinguished lawyer. I first 
became aware of his eminence when he was runner-up to me in the Vinerian Fellowship in Oxford <laughs> and said no. Um, none of those things, I think, reflect on the fairness of the trial, um, but um, if you want, uh, on the other hand, Sergeant Sullivan was treated as being, or has been treated by history as being inept, and I don't think that's really fair um, in so much of the stuff that I've read. And in particular, his cross-examination of John McCarthy is, the is an example of somebody who seems to be in complete control of the, co the courtroom. I don't have time to, to, to go through it in detail. But McCarthy said, um, had to explain what he was doing in the morning of Good Friday. And he said he had got up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go to a holy well to say prayers. And or he said to go to a holy well, where was it? He couldn't remember. What was the name of it? He couldn't remember that. Uh, Effie Smith stands up and says, oh, it was a holy well, it being Good Friday. Um, and, and Smith and Sullivan says, being, it being a holy well, you'll remember the name. He says, I can't remember a name, it's in Irish. And Sullivan says, and, and that's more reason for us to know it, or we being in a strange country um, and you not, ha you, having, you, you, know, you not having the Irish of it. Now, nobody in court, certainly nobody in an Irish court would have believed Mr. McCar John McCarthy that he had got up to go to a holy well that he didn't know the name of at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> um, and, and that he couldn't, uh, couldn't remember the name of. The only person who believed it was, was Effie Smith's son and biographer who said, showing the extraordinary piety of the people, <laughs> he had gone to say his prayers on Good Friday. <laughs> but there's an almost a moment where I think Sullivan and McCarthy recognize each other, which is that McCarthy was there for some other reason. That, that he, uh, and it may have been that he had been, that he was hoping that he was on the lookout for just something like this. It may have it meant that he was on some um, venture that, didn't, that couldn't be revealed in open court. And these were people who had met each other, the type of person who had met each other in Irish courts up and down the country where Sergeant Sullivan practiced. And there's almost a moment where Sullivan says, well, where does this get me to, and, and we move on. But it doesn't look like a man who doesn't know what he's doing or is not in charge of the court. Now, finally, um, uh, you look at the trial and say, I don't think the lawyers deserve casements uh, treatment of them. Gavin Duffy is a hero. Um, Michael Francis Doyle is to be admired. Um, the, the other lawyers, you know, they did their job. They may not have enhanced their reputations, but they did, I don't think they did anything uh, that fell below the standards that could be expected of them, either in competence or behaviour. If you want villains, however, there are plenty of villains. Uh, Sir Ernley Blackwell was the, uh, the, the lawyer in the Home Office who campaigned most vigorously against Casement and against his tenancy. And he was the person who insisted on the propagation of the diaries to destroy Casement's repu reputation. When Sergeant Sullivan arrived in England, Effie Smith sent him the diaries under the pretext that he might want them to make a plea of insanity. Sergeant Sullivan sent them back through Artemis Jones unread. Now, he was absolutely right about that for, every, for a whole series of tactical reasons. But what does that tell you? Well, it tells you something that he then said himself. He knew what was in the diaries. It was already common currency um, in, 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 um, in circles in London. Uh, and Blackwell was promoting them. Another distinguished lawyer, Herbert Henry Asquith, um, uh, who became pri prime minister, who had been Parnell's junior in the Parnell Commission, spoke to the American ambassador and said, had he seen copies of the diaries which were photographed, it was, an, you know, it was an expensive and difficult undertaking to produce facsimile copies of the diaries. And the American ambassador said he had, and Asquith said, uh, good, and don't trouble to keep them to yourself. So there was a, a, a campaign to blacken Casement's name, which was very widespread and effective, and so effective that when Casement was um, when his appeal was, was, was dismissed and when he was executed on the 3rd of, of August, the Times said um, they, the discreditable things were done. It would have been better had he been shot on a Kerry beach than that, than that people would have stooped to methods, so, uh, 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 something to that effect, which was a, which was a very clear reference to the, to the propagation of the diaries. And in one sense, a sign that if there was a strategy to present this process 
as demonstrating British fairness. It failed. If you want victims, I don't think displacement was in one sense. It, sort of, it, it certainly played to his vanity to be centerpiece of, the, uh, of this trial that was being, being reported all around the world. But there were victims. Uh, he's, he was perhaps a martyr. He's become a hero. He's not really a victim of this process. But the Kerry witnesses, John McCarthy the chance is it was something of a chancer and he survived. He went back, he put in a compensation claim for having a found an enemy vessel, which was the inflatable dinghy. He put in a compensation claim for his loss of turnips and the, the various things, and which I imagine in the great history of Irish claims and litigation did not understate his loss. And he seems to have gone back <laughs> and, and lived his life. Martin Collins was from Ardfert. His family ran a hotel. Very shortly after this, these events, they applied for an extension of the hotel and for a license. That occurred in open court. And someone was, and they said, it's the Collins Hotel, and a, a, a voice was heard to say they should call it the Casement Collins Hotel because the implication was that he had been paid in some way and that this money was being used. And it was a sign of how sentiment had turned. And he emigrated to New Zealand. And in 1966, you know, people were talking, there was a, a, a number of stories about this, and there was a story about the Ardfert witnesses that was sympathetic to the, the people who had found themselves swept up in this and brought from the coast of Kerry to the centre of the empire and, this, and, and in the centre of this pomp and drama and legal circumstance. And he, and he refused to open it because he said, that has caused me so much pain in my life. I don't want, to. he didn't, he, 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 he saw them, he actually saw the, the, the postmark was Kerry and he said, I don't want to open that. And, he, and his daughter r recalled that. He never knew that that and if you like, sentiment had started to turn back again. And Mary Gorman, the, the serving girl, she became a celebrity figure in London, the broth of an Irish girl. People talk, the pictorial newspapers talked about her, beautiful Irish brogue, a broth of a girl, isn't she fantastic? She talked about, sure, there's, she was reported saying things like, sure, the crowds of people on the streets, we never have anything like that at home. And so, and she became a minor celebrity. She was taken up by a member of the aristocracy. She was given clothes. Um, and in a sense, the inevitable happened. She met uh, a soldier. She arrived back in, in Ireland, you know, and she discovered she had a contracted syphilis. That involved an, uh, a, a hor horrifying application to the local guardians who humiliated her on two counts, you know. Um, and the local doc a doctor was saved her, if you like, got her to Dublin, to hospital, she was treated in Dublin in hospital. She emigrated, she changed her name and emigrated to America and nobody knows what became of her. Um, so there are, you know, there are tragedies attached to this. There are victims. Michael Francis Doyle uh, became a papal knight. He became an honor, a bencher of the Honorable Society of King's Inns. He was a very significant figure, became a judge of the International Court of Justice and a sort of an interesting and significant figure. He reported to Mr. Tumulty that he had been allowed to be part of the legal team. Did you do anything, Michael, said Tumulty. I did. I looked all things up and I discovered, I told Casement and advised him that he was entitled to be shot and not hanged. <laughs> and Tumulty said, and did you charge him for that advice? <laughs> but, in 19, but the famous bit of trial series produced an account of the Casement trial. The first account was in 19, the early, I think, around about 1920, edited by a man called G.A. Knott and dedicated obsequiously to Lord Reading, um, Rufus Isaacs, the Lord Chief Justice, and Mr. Justice Darley. It was then taken up, the second edition is by H. Montgomery Hyde, a very interesting man who was both an incongruously, an Ulster Unionist MP in the 1950s and a campaigner for homosexual law reform. And he wrote a, 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 he wrote a fascinating and very sympathetic introduction to uh, the book, to the famous British trials and dedicated it to Michael Doyle. Um, Montgomery Hyde, um, post the Wolfenden report, he, um, or he wasn't post the Wolfenden report, early days, he proposed homosexual law reform. And as a result, he triggered protests, unsu perhaps unsurprisingly, but disappointingly in Northern Ireland, which was one of the first protests launched by the young Reverend Ian Paisley. And he was deselected as a unionist MP. But he, he 
wrote the famous British Isles, he continued to, uh, while an MP, he agitated in relation to the diaries for the production of the diaries and agitated in respect of the Roger Casement. And he dedicates this version to Michael Francis Doyle. And in 1950, I think around the time the painting came to Dublin, they were both in Dublin, Fran Michael Francis Doyle and H. Montgomery Hyde. And that incongruous pair, the Irish Ameri American Papal Knight and the Ulster Unionist campaigner for homosexual law reform made a sentimental journey to Kerry to the coast where Sir Roger Casement had landed. And if you remember the words of the poem that I mentioned at the very start of this very long uh, talk, um, I like to think of that as an answering signal of sorts. Thank you. stunning and brilliant lecture and it's like somebody putting together a, a 10,000 piece jigsaw and showing us so many connections interwoven in an amazing way. Um, um, I'm going to add and abuse the privileges of chairmanship which I always do by just one or two further observations and let it be its own tribute to a truly fantastic uh, and inspiring lecture. Um, and they're diverse. But you know, one of the things is this, is that, um, and this is you know, today, 101 years plus since the start of the Civil War, um, uh, but I was reading in recent times about the Finnish Civil War. And Finland, of course, obtained its independence in 1917 from Russia, um, about the same population as us. But very interestingly, two Two interesting facts, I think, that kind of in its own way sort of bear on this. You know, one of the, the unanswered questions is what would have happened in 1915 if the Ord had landed? Uh, and I think, you know, it would have been fairly tricky for the British in those circumstances in an undefended, a substantially undefended island if, um, if arms had been landed. And what, what was fascinating for me was that the Finnish Civil War lasted four months, but the Germans sent a submarine uh, to the um, uh, west coast of Finland, to Emea, and landed um, uh, arms and heavy weaponry for the whites uh, who were fighting the Reds in the, in the Finnish Civil War. And that was regarded as one of the critical factors that turned the Civil War in favor of the whites and defeated the communist Reds. So it's just an example of, you know, we were forever thinking, you know, during our school days that, that all these various, you know, attempts to land arms in Ireland or troops in Ireland ranging from, you know, the, the Spanish in 1601, the French in 1798, the Ord in 1915, and somehow there was always bad weather or bad luck or it never worked. But I can tell you, the one time it counted in Finland, so as far as the whites were concerned, it did work. And the, and the Germans did land, did land, and it, it did land the, the arms in a submarine like the, uh, and uh, it's interesting to see what would have happened. Uh, you know, the Finns were successful and the Ord was not. That's one thing. Second thing, just as an, a total aside, and I'm gonna come back to the time in a moment, is that what was striking, you know, we think of the Civil War, and it is tragic, 77 were executed, or maybe it's 81. But you know, the figures for the Finnish Civil War, there's a, their population is pretty well the same as ours, and it lasted for only four months. And these are executions, you know, not casualties of war, executions. The Reds executed over two and a half thousand people in four months. But that's nothing to the whites. The whites executed almost 10,000, executed almost 10,000 people in four months. So, you know, that puts civil war in context. Um, it just, sorry, I, I'm two or, two or three other small little bits and pieces that um, um, uh, um, it's interesting that the diaries were of such concern and interest to the uh, Irish penitentiaries during the treaty that 
one of the things that Collins and Griffith wanted to keep was the diaries. And I think they were pretty well convinced mm. that, I think, that they were genuine. Uh, but certainly Sergeant Sullivan in 1956 gave an interview, I think I'm right in on oh yes, an interview, yes. in which he, um, he had said that Casement had told him that he was homosexual. And that led to, at uh, this stage, Ca Sullivan was a ra very old man, I think, by those kinds of things. Well, well into his 80s. Well into his 80s. Um. Uh, and the, there was then a petition in the law library uh, signed by a number of, is it to the benches? It was, it, it was, it was, he had, he had come back to Ireland. He had secured this painting. Yeah. He had been made an honorary bencher right, at the yeah, King's yeah, Inns. Yeah. There was a letter to the paper. He couldn't resist come taking up the cudgels. And there was a petition to the benchers at the King's Inns to but remove him as an honorary bencher. Yeah. And, and the detractors of yeah. Sergeant Sullivan yeah. are named in, in Kenneth Ferguson's in book. In Kenneth's book, yeah. And it's, which, a, you know. Which include Mr. Justice Brian Walsh. That's Paul, right. Among mm. a number of other mm. um, and just one other thing, um, when once we go through all of these, mm. there's an ama it, 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 it was an amazing synergy, uh, Donald, the way you linked, you know, each piece with its uh, with with another, and, um, but Sir John Simon, you know, he said who had to, who had refused the king, and the person who as Lord Chancellor, um, you know had his reputation, well, he was foreign secretary mm. in 38, 39, and he was regarded as, along with Chamberlain, mm. one of the architects of appeasement, and therefore, post-Second World War, his reputation was forever set. He was Lord, made Lord Chancellor by Churchill, when Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940, mm. and of course, as Donald has explained, in the famous Labyrinth of Liberties in Anderson, he attempted, or one view, attempted to persuade Mr. Justice Afton there to change his judgment, which Afton refused to do. And as Donald has said, Afton was sent to Coventry and died two years later with none of his colleagues ever speaking to him again. But go back to 1917, um, Simon um, had resigned from the government mm. because um, uh, he opposed conscription. He apparently refused to brief in the Casement case, but he was persuaded by Lord George uh, to conduct um, a, a, what we would now call a kind of commission of inquiry or a tribunal of inquiry into the killing during 1916 oh. of Sheehy Skeffington. And he, I think, is the last person who ever became Lord Chancellor uh, um, uh, to sit in the forecourts. And he sat in what is now Court 4 uh, in 1917 and conducted an inquiry into the murder uh, of uh, Sheehy Skeffington uh, by the, by, um, uh, doing Bold, the, uh, Bold, 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 Bold 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 yeah. uh, um, And um, he, Simon, on that occasion, came under enormous pressure from Lord George to deliver the right verdict because the killing of Sheehy Skeffington was something that had inflamed Irish and American opinion. But um, Simon did not flinch and delivered <coughs> a, a, a devastating account as to what Bone, Col Bone Col Colthurst had done. It killed him in cold blood. And um, Simon's report has something in the same, murder is murder and is not excused under the name of martial law. So um, you know, <coughs> there are many, many, you, uh, you've, you've woven such a fantastic web of interest uh, in the last hour and it was truly stunning lecture um, and maybe do we have time for questions do we well we could have time for about five minutes about five minutes okay the chairman better stop abusing his privileges <laughs> yes quickly yes sorry thank you very much thank you out of curiosity uh, during the fall of when guys say the glazers may have to supply ingredients to the to make a pasta would the style be in the back of the mind when they were planning what Susan was, i.e. A, a bakery, had a case come up with a similar fact in the Irish <coughs> court post-independence, would they say this is from Cecilia or would they say actually... I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to do a more a, a pass across the table here, but I, I think it certainly was very much in their mind, wasn't mm. it? Mm. And there was... Mm. Um, 
yes is, is the yes. answer. I mean, in, in many ways, um, if you look at the Irish constitutional position, 1932 to 1937, very significant steps were taken deliberately to say we're not going to do what was done on, under the, the British system. Yeah. Uh, Article 39 is mm. modelled on Article 3 of the US Constitution mm. in terms of defining treason. And the Treason Act gi 39 gives us that clue. I mean, one small further footnote for you is, is that when Lord Hawho is captured by the mm. um, <coughs> William Joyce, he's captured mm. by the British um, um, after getting into the war. He was, <coughs> well, born in Galway. And he had, uh, he was a supporter of Sir Oswald Mosley, the fascist leader, British fascist leader, gone to London to Berlin in, just as people mm. were traveling the other direction, at the very end of August 1939, mm -hmm. and uh, then broadcast to, you know, Germany, Poland, and so on. Um, but when he was arrested, he was held by the British on the continent mm. until they passed a treason act. to make sure there would be no Mr. McConnell or Creases. And, or and, 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 like and there was also an issue about his, he had foolishly obtained a passport, exactly. I think, um, because otherwise he would have been able to contend that he didn't owe or fealty mm -hmm. to the Crown. Yeah. And if you look at the case that you'll find, fascinatingly, I think, anyway, in the criminal appeal reports, I think, you'll find the, queen, the king against Joyce, yeah. and it, you know, there's a, a law report, like all the law reports you come across, and at the bottom, you know, authorities cited R versus Casement. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, um, and I mean, a small another little detail was that it was actually four-one in the House of Lords um, um, with a dissenter, but the uh, judgments were only delivered after the yeah. dissenter had been dismissed. <laughs> uh, one more uh, comment. One, um, we can take one or two more. Don't you talk them into submissions or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have yeah, yeah, so yes, thank you. Thanks very much for it. I, I think you want to talk. It's, just, it's a more a personal question rather than about the law. Like, this obviously is a question uh, to you along with all the previous Genesis. Uh, um, I, I, Gavin, that's, that's yeah. About the process of, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and we, um, because, uh, there are a whole lot of things that come together for me in the Caseman story. One is that he was the, regarded as the only northerner involved in execute as a result of 1916, which is why Caseman Park in Belfast is Caseman Park. So you had that, I had that. Antrim has a sort of, the north of Antrim, the glens of Antrim have a particular resonance in northern nationalist circles and my grandfather came from the north of, Ant north, of uh, north Antrim. My father, brought his father and my brother to the funeral of Sir Roger Casement in 1965, I think, because it yeah. wasn't 66, right. when he was brought to, to Dublin. And um, I remember talking about it, and then he told me some of the stories about the, about the trial. And then um, I got married and I went on my honeymoon to Kerry, and I have a house now on the Maharese Peninsula, which is where the odd sailed up and down. And the man who built my house was a lived on an island. He was a pilot. Or his family were pilots, and his grandfather is the man that was meant to meet the odd in 1916. So I sort of felt this this thing is following me around. And <laughs> <laughs> it's providence. Mm -hmm. uh, providence. Anyway. Um, so. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, look, we have been truly privileged, truly, truly privileged, with an absolutely fantastic, stunning lecture. Uh, that brings together politics, law, history, and full of insight into which Britain is passionately verve. Uh, and it is a real privilege, it has been a real privilege to be here this afternoon. Uh, and um, I, I would just like you to show our appreciation to the Chief Justice in the usual ways. Thank you.